Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Rabbi Julia Andelman, Director of Community Engagement here at JTS, and I'm happy to um, welcome you or welcome you back after our uh, break for June 19th. I hope that you had um, meaningful commemorations of some kind um, of that, that day and all the issues that it represents uh, for those, for those um, US residents in our group. Um, if uh, for anyone joining us for the first time today, a special welcome to you. And um, you can see previous sessions uh, at the, the link, the series page link that was in the email that you got this morning. Um, we are very happy to have Professor David Creamer teaching us today as part of our uh, Dynamics of Change summer series. Um, this session is called Patient Change, Slow Influence, the Model of the Rabbis of Late Antiquity. And uh, regulars at this series will have learned with Professor Kramer many times before, but it'll be a different kind of session today as they'll explain. So we're uh, intrigued and can't wait, Professor Kramer. Um, just a heads up that we do not have a session next Monday, July 3rd. Um, we expect many of you will be away doing other things and then we'll continue after that um, through through August. So we'll have, I guess, a straight month after that of sessions. Um, we're so grateful today to our sponsors, Drora and Mati Shalev, who have sponsored today at the Chacham level in honor of the JTS community and of this series. So uh, thank you so much to the Shalevs for your generosity and for, um, for that, that kind of vote of, uh, of solidarity and, and community with all of this, this whole uh, group of wonderful adult learners um, who've joined us. Um, if other folks are feeling inspired by the Shalev's generosity or by this opportunity to learn with JTS faculty, we would love for you to consider partnering with us as well. We have three sponsorship levels, um, Chacham for 540, Tzadik for 1000, and Abi for 1800. And uh, there's a link going into the chat where you can learn more about that. Um, and I will now turn it over to Tani Schwartzerman. Thank you, Rabbi Andelman. Um, so just to go over the format of our session today, uh, Professor Kramer will pause for questions periodically throughout the class and we'll have some time for Q&A at the end as well. Um, you can use your chat feature to submit your questions to Rabbi Julia Andelman and during the Q&A period, Rabbi Andelman will select a few of the questions to present to Professor Kramer. Since we receive a large number of questions, we would appreciate it if you could express your question both clearly in complete sentences and also concisely. For any technical or logistical questions, please initiate a private chat with either myself or Ellie Gettinger. Um, the PowerPoint presentation for today's class um, will be uh, screen shared during our session. Um, we'll also share a link shortly in the chat. Um, and we're so pleased to have Professor Kramer teaching us today. Uh, Dr. David Kramer is the Joseph J. and Dora Abel Librarian at the Jewish Theological Seminary where he also served as professor of Talmud and rabbinics for many years. Um, as librarian, Professor Kramer oversees the most extensive collection of Judaica in the Western Hemisphere. Professor Kramer has written several books, um, including Rabbinic Judaism, Space and Place, which he will be drawing from in today's session. And more information about his published works is available on the bio that appears as part of the PowerPoint presentation. Um, so please to turn it over to Professor Kramer. Okay, thank you, Tani. Um, and um, just a correction there, the um, the book that uh, I will be, in my discussion will be drawing on is my history of the Talmud, um, which appeared uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, but otherwise, <laughs> all correct. And thank you. Uh, Julia, I just want to uh, say, I, I appreciate your uh, calling out and asking people to think about the way they commemorated Juneteenth, which has become a national holiday here in the U.S. Uh, and indeed it is. It's never a puzzle for me to remember what I was doing on Juneteenth, since it also happens to be my wedding anniversary. Um, so I, I always know exactly what I'm doing on Juneteenth. Uh, hello, everybody. It's great to be back with you. It's great to see some of you. Needless to say, I can't see all of you on one screen. So I'm just going to imagine your interested faces out there. And I hope that we will have a very interesting discussion. Uh, I want to 
emphasize um, that this is going to be a very different sort of session than those that I've given in the past for this program. And I imagine it's going to be very different from sessions that you're accustomed to seeing by other presenters as well. I will, when I share my screen, you'll see when we go through the um, presentation, I will be sharing not a single traditional text with you today. Uh, and that is because there is nothing that I'm presenting that can be captured in a single text. I, I could have chosen isolated traditional texts from rabbinic literature, Mishnah, Talmud, and they would have been representative in very small part. But what I'd like to do, rather than focusing in that way, is ask a very, very grand question and to look at broad developments and phenomena that will help us to appreciate how the rabbis negotiated change as emerging leaders of the Jewish community after the destruction of the temple. Uh, since this sequence of sessions overall is about change, change agents, the way uh, those who aspire to leadership can influence others and seek to change society, culture in a direction that they have in mind, these are very, very grand, broad phenomena, very, very difficult uh, to capture in small little pieces. And so what you can expect is a very lengthy thought experiment. We're going to be asking a question, uh, and I'll lay the question out at the very beginning, and then I will, um, you know, together, we'll kind of explore the possibilities for answering it. Uh, some of the things that I'll be presenting, I'm quite sure that you've heard before. Some of the ways of thinking about it, I hope, are very different from the way you've thought about them before. Uh, and if what I have to say uh, surprises you, challenges you at certain points, that's great. Uh, just feel free to throw a question into chat, and that will provide us the opportunity to have a discussion about this. So let's begin with the question. Um, all historians, uh, and here I am using the term historian in a very, very broad way. I don't mean professional historians. I mean, anybody who's interested in history uh, and knows something about Jewish history. Um, so anybody who is a historian in that broad sense of the term would agree with the following facts. Uh, and uh, I will say a word about a possible small exception here um, the, the, after I lay out the question. So um, what is the fact? The fact is that if we were to look at the Jewish landscape before the last years when the second temple and Jerusalem existed, so let's say, you know, the imaginary year zero, um, or its equivalents, the last part of the first century before the Common Era, if we were to look at the Jewish landscape at that time and ask how did Jews identify, how did they observe their religion, what did they consider to be central, um, what did they consider to be paramount, we would have had a relatively clear answer. Uh, the canonical text that defined the way they were supposed to conduct their lives was the Torah, along with the rest of Hebrew scripture. Uh, the center of at least national Jewish practice would have been the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, if we began to look at details of the way they lived their lives in the everyday, we could fill in a lot about that too, um, because there is documentation about Jewish life during these years in the Apocrypha, Pseudepigrapha, Dead Sea Scrolls, and so forth. So that's the before. Um, then if we were to jump about five to six centuries, um, we would be looking at a Jewish landscape that was radically different than the one that I just described. First of all, uh, at least as aspiring and to some degree already real leaders of the Jewish community, when we're talking about, say, the 6th century, 7th century, um, there would be no doubt that prominent candidates for 
the leadership of the Jewish community would have been the rabbis, um, both in the land of Israel and in Babylonia. Note, in the year 50 BCE, there was no such thing as a rabbi. That didn't exist. Um, so over the course of, say, these six centuries, um, a leadership uh, that went from, I don't know, was it priesthood? Was it local influentials, wealthy Jews who lived in the land of Israel? We could talk about that, but certainly no rabbis. Uh, influential in the sphere of uh, Jewish direction and practice would have been, depending upon what party you belong to, Pharisees, Sadducees, we'll come back to them later on. Uh, if we jump now these six centuries, again, we have rabbis, and then we have people whom we will name later, um, but it's the rabbis we need to focus on. Um, they are there in very prominent positions, defining Jewish practice, defining Jewish belief, uh, providing answers for what Jews are supposed to do, uh, both in the land of Israel and Babylon, and the simple question we're going to be addressing is, how did the before become the after? How is it that the rabbis, who literally did not exist um, in the year, say, 50 BCE, uh, how did they come to be the most notable leaders of the Jewish community, religiously speaking at least, when we get to the 6th, 7th century of the Common Era? That's the puzzle. That's the question. Uh, and that's what we're going to try to figure out. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and I, what I just stated as the puzzle, the question you'll see at the beginning, but let's see where it goes from there. Um, so I've got share and um, Tane, I can see your face on my screen. So shake it up and down if you can see the first page. It's there. It's good. Okay, great. Um, so there you see my name and my bio, you've already heard that. Um, so um, this is where we begin, right? Before the rabbis, and I'll say a word about when the rabbis emerge, but before the rabbis, um, there was the temple uh, at the center, but there were no rabbis. The temple was crucial. When we use the term central in description of the temple in Jerusalem, we mean it both literally and figuratively. It was at the center of the Jewish world. It was the destination to which Jews made pilgrimage. It was where the relationship of God and Israel was maintained. And when there had been breaches in that relationship, it's where it had been repaired. There were at that time no rabbis. But Ben, what, it's not responding here. Why is it? There we go. So what was there? Um, there were, as I said, sectarians. Um, I put the term Pharisees here because uh, the connection between the rabbis and the Pharisees is often pointed out, but we have to be very careful with that connection. The other groups that many of you have heard of, Sadducees, Essenes, uh, there are others as well, the rabbis claim no relationship to those groups, uh, and it's hard to see any real connection between those groups and the rabbis who would emerge subsequently. But the rabbis do claim a connection to prominent Pharisees, uh, and historians have seen certain connections between positions that are attributed to the Pharisees and positions that the rabbis claim later on. So. That's a fair connection, but it's very, very crucial for us at the same time to note that the rabbis never claim to actually be Pharisees. They never claim to be the successors as such as Pharisees. And the truth is, we know very, very little about the Pharisees. Um, the primary testimony we have for the Pharisees is Josephus. Uh, he, he's interested in very different sorts of things than the rabbis were. So uh, the safest for us probably will simply to say that there are some connections between what we'll see in the rabbinic movement and the Pharisees, uh, but it's hard to know how many and the likelihood, and I, I will expand upon this as we go ahead, is that there uh, 
are many things that characterize the rabbis that the Pharisees knew nothing of. Uh, before the destruction of the temple, uh, there were also people who you can see, I put this in scare quotes, who we might call lawyers. There is a Greek term uh, that is used that's translated here as lawyers. Uh, it means experts in the law. And of course, Judaism centering on the sacred document called Torah. Uh, and as you all know, Torah is amongst other things centrally about law. There is abundant law in the Torah. Those who were experts in that law, let's call them lawyers, had certain respect in the Jewish community because Jews at this point always respected those who were expert in the Torah that they held to be sacred. Um, so the rabbis can see some roots in the Pharisees. They can certainly see some roots in the lawyers, uh, the experts in the Torah law. Uh, and crucially, in order for there to be a law and other things, but in order for there to be a law in the ancient world, there need obviously to be scribes. And scribes here means two things. It means, first of all, those who had the technical knowledge of copying texts, because the only way anybody had a text was by copying it. Uh, but scribes also were experts in the sacred writings uh, because they were immersed in them as they copied them. Uh, and there is a level at which, therefore, the rabbis can see some root in the scribes as well. Having said all of this, um, or having said that we can find the seeds planted of at least some of what would characterize the rabbis later on, um, it's still fair to say that Pharisees, lawyers, and scribes does not come together into a coherent religious program. Uh, and of course, what it leaves out is what I showed in the previous slide, which was the temple, which was unambiguously central to the whole operation. Um, so then, right, given what I just said, the temple in Jerusalem, uh, along comes the destruction of that central institution. Uh, and the question becomes, how does a Jew respond? Uh, we do have actually some evidence, some relatively direct evidence concerning how Jews responded. But uh, here I invite you to think, how would I have responded under similar circumstances? If everything you took for granted, if the institutions that you assumed were central, all of a sudden disappeared. I, I, I hate to do this because, um, you know, what I'm about to suggest is actually a painful thought, but it's no more painful than the thought of the temple destroyed would have been to a Jew living in, say, the year 50. Uh, of the first century, right? That would have been an extremely painful thought. They would have said to themselves, how can I possibly go on without that? So for us, the equivalent to that would be something like, how would you respond if the state of Israel were destroyed, right? Given the centrality of that state to Jewish life today. That is a fair parallel, I think. Uh, and if you feel that parallel with pain, if you say to yourself, I can't imagine, if you say to yourself, I don't know how I would respond, I don't even know if Jews could survive such a catastrophe, all of that would have been a fair comparison uh, to the destruction of the temple in the year 70. So let's think about it. How would a person respond to a catastrophe that is that immense? So here I've given you just a schematic layout. Uh, obviously, when one thinks in schematic terms, there are nuances, there are details um, that we're not doing justice to. So let me, um, you know, say that at the very beginning. But uh, just to play it out a little bit, one possibility is that you stick with the old to the extent possible. Okay, so what would that mean? Um, anything that you can still do? You do, right? So anything that didn't rely on the temple for its performance, you continue to do that. But of course, in the first century after the destruction of the temple, 
that would have left a vast gap, right? A literal gap and a gap in your soul because there were parts of a religious Jewish life that didn't have a way of being expressed in the absence of the temple. So it's fine to say that you would stick to the old uh, and uh, again, to look for a parallel, um, if you think about the debates that occurred after 9-11, say, or the debates that continue to occur um, as the our experience with COVID um, becomes less than it was in the past, these were major events. The question is, how do they change the world? Can we keep things the way they were? Uh, and our first reactions, depending upon which event we're talking about, might have been, okay, we'll live through this, we'll get through it, and we'll go back to the old. But lo and behold, it turns out that not everything goes back to the way it was, right? So what are your choices? So if you can't stick with the old, then one possibility um, is you give up um, and say that what you were involved in then was a losing proposition. It can't be maintained anymore in the absence of the central institution. This was a very real option for Jews living after the destruction of the temple. You can see that the second thought that I added to this um, was, what, you know, what did giving up mean? Uh, it meant assimilating to the Roman cult and religion. And we'll go ahead in a moment to consider the evidence we have of Jewish life in the land of Israel following the destruction of the temple. Uh, and that evidence is very clear that there are many Jews who may have thought of themselves still as Jews, but nevertheless, um, who effectively gave up, uh, said that God that we thought was our God either was an illusion or a loser all along. Uh, and so they began to assimilate more and more into Roman cult, religion, Roman ways in general. Uh, the third possibility um, is to try something new. Um, Roman cult wasn't new, it was just different. Um, the question of new always is, okay, so what's new? You know, what is it that we're going to suggest to at least partially replace what we've lost? And this is where on the spectrum, I think the rabbis lie, um, and we'll see the way this works out uh, as we go forward. So uh, I've made some claims here. I've laid out the possibilities. I imagine some questions have developed, but hold those questions. Just record them in the chat for a moment. I want to consider the evidence um, to support what I just said, because I'm going to guess that some of you um, have got those questions. So um, we'll look here first at short-term evidence, and uh, in particular, um, at, we'll begin with non-rabbinic evidence, because rabbinic evidence is, for reasons I will explain uh, in a couple of minutes, problematic. So obviously, uh, archaeology provides us with a lot. Uh, I have to say here as a general observation, uh, archaeology always requires interpretation, um, and humans are very, very clever at interpreting things. Um, so archaeology has no single meaning ever. When you read the report of an archaeologist, um, take the descriptions in, uh, but always ask yourself, uh, do these interpretations make sense? Um, so that's the general warning. But when we look at the archaeology of the land of Israel from the first century and beyond, uh, and the most prominent of those remains are burial sites, which on account of being during that period underground, uh, really are well preserved in the land of Israel. You, you can uh, tour many of them. Uh, remains of urban life are, are, are somewhat less, but given uh, the activities of Israeli archaeologists, we actually have a lot of material there as well. Uh, and what we can say, so let's begin with burial sites. Uh, Jews during these centuries in the land of Israel were mostly buried in burial caves. Uh, there are multiple caves around Jerusalem. Sanhedria is one of those in, in the park near the King David Hotel. We've got um, We've got burial caves, but if you go further afield, there are much larger uh, and better preserved burial caves. Um, so if you go up near Haifa to Beit Sharim, 
uh, it, which is a national park, you can take tours of these burial caves. And what you'll see there is that the burials are little distinguished from Roman burial at the same time. Um, and the Beit Sharim uh, burial site, those caves are very important because while on the one side, there is very clear evidence of rabbis amongst others being buried um, in Beit Sharim. And here I have to emphasize that I use the word burial uh, only because I don't have a better term in English. I, I don't know if there is a term in English. They weren't buried at all. Um, they were um, many, not all, placed in stone sarcophagi um, when the flesh um, was gone. After someone's death, they may have taken the bones from the sarcophagus and put the in a bone uh, container, uh, an ossuary, which itself would have been placed on the ground or on a shelf in the side, in the wall of the cave. Uh, sometimes you have, quote unquote, burials without sarcophagi and in shelves dug into the walls of the cave. But don't imagine any of this being underground in the sense of a hole dug and then dirt thrown over. Um, the sarcophagi have common Roman symbols. The decorations are very common Roman artistic symbols. Um, so aside from names here and there uh, and some obvious Jewish references, the Roman quality of this burial dominates to a very significant extent. We know that there are rabbis who exist, but we have no idea what in the world they might be doing or actually who they are if we didn't know from outside, meaning from the literature they left us, um, who they were. Remains of urban life actually support the kind of um, picture that I just offered as well. If you go to Galilean cities from the centuries, the first few centuries after the destruction of the temple, um, they were commonly uh, very mixed sites, uh, even uh, rather sophisticated. They had residents and traders who traveled through uh, from Asia Minor to Egypt, from Asia to a a Asia Minor, uh, they were places where populations mixed uh, and where cultures mixed. Um, rabbis did live in those places, but they didn't leave us any testimony um, beyond references to the town names uh, regarding what those places looked like. And so if we ask what was Jewish life in those places, again, you would say, oh, it was like common Roman uh, imperial, meaning, you know, in a part of the empire, a uh, Roman life in an eastern flank of the Roman Empire. We also have written testimony from this period, which has been conveniently gathered uh, by a, a one uh, scholar who, who did a favor to the rest of us by bringing them together. Um, and when we look at Roman writings, writings of the Roman period in Latin, there's some Greek still during this period, um, regarding the Jews, they certainly notice Jews, although I do have to say that what they notice about Jews, oddly included in this volume more than anything else, is that great natural phenomenon called the Dead Sea, which they can't believe uh, has the qualities it does, so it's often reported upon. But just in terms of Jews, uh, they notice Jews, they know that Jews have certain eating practices that make it difficult for those who observe those eating practices with their neighbors. But interestingly, there's no evidence that Jews are, do I mean, Jews are observing the Sabbath, but there's no evidence of Jews eating or observing the Sabbath or doing other things in ways that we would identify as rabbinic. Um, what the non-Jewish writers see uh, is Jewish practice according to the sacred document that goes back for centuries. Now, the rabbinic evidence is very different. Um, and I'd like to spend some time on this, but um, just to say a word about it before uh, diving into it. Um, and Julia, in one second, I want to take questions on everything I've you know, presented so far, because this deserves a little bit uh, of dedicated time. 
Um, but the first document that the rabbis produce is the Mishnah, a document that many of you have some experience with, even if you couldn't say a lot about it. Uh, it is a legal work. It is the first expression of rabbinic opinion in Jewish law and practice from about the year 200. Um, it's very abundant. It's very detailed. Um, but it is also um, an elitist and one might even say sectarian document. In other words, the Mishnah speaks not for Jews at this period. It speaks for rabbis. So when we look at the Mishnah or at its parallel texts, we know what the rabbis think. Um, but if the rabbis are few and lack influence, then what we see in the Mishnah won't speak for Jews in general at all. So that's what I'd like to consider with you going forward. But first, I want to provide an opportunity if people have specific questions about what I've offered this far. All right, tons of questions. Um, the first is, and a handful of people asked this, uh, if you can define what you mean when you say rabbi, since you know we've talked about all the, all the people who were not rabbis. So what do you mean when you say what would what would qualify someone as a rabbi in this time? What a great question. Um, uh, what would qualify someone as a rabbi? Um, not that they work at a synagogue, right? That didn't happen until much, much later. Um, you know, so they shouldn't think about rabbis as we think about rabbis. Um, rabbi during this period means someone who goes more or less by that term and who identifies with this group or movement. Uh, we know that the term rabbi was used as an honorific, kind of like master or, or you know, Mr., Mrs., or the like. Um, so, and it was even used for master, meaning, you know, master disciple or master teacher. Jesus um, was called uh, rabbi by disciples in a couple of the New Testament books, but that doesn't mean he was a rabbi. That's why I add he identified with this particular movement. So um, rabbis are the folks who produce the literature that we call rabbinic. Is that circular? It absolutely is, but we have no better definition than that. Okay, fair enough. Um, there were also, questions about connections to other um, other pre-rabbinic leaders or leadership bodies um, that we've heard about. People asked about the the Anshe at Knesset Abdullah, the men of the Great Assembly uh, referred to in Pirkei Avot. They asked about the, the Zugot, the pairs such as Hillel and Shammai. Um, people asked about the Sanhedrin. Um, and so I'll leave it there, but um, Questions I get the idea. I get the idea. Okay, so um, here we've got to do a little bit of real history, okay? Because um, obviously, when one refers to avot, pirkei avot, we're not dealing with history. We're dealing with rabbinic teachings um, regarding a particular tradition. Um, so the history works something like this. And here I've got to be careful because there's been, ironically some misunderstanding of what the rabbis meant when they were referring to certain things. So beginning with what you said, the men of the great assembly, Anshe Knesset Hagdolah. There was no such thing as a Knesset Hagdolah um, in the way that it is often used. And the rabbis actually knew that. Um, the problem is that the rabbinic teachings did not have the chronological understanding we have. So um, the Knesset Agdolah refers to the gathering of elders in Jerusalem at the great convocation at the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. Right? So when you hear Anshe Knesset Agdolah, that's what it's referring to, um, the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. The rabbis, though, who wrote that first chapter of Pirkei Avot, for example, had no idea that such a long period, several centuries passed 
between that convocation and the people they call the pairs, the zugot, as they give us that chain of tradition. Um, and a chain of tradition is always a legend. It's always making a claim for authority. It's never a piece of history. Um, let me deal with Hillel and Shammai. I, I, I mean, when we go back to the people who are listed in those zugot, um, we have no idea if, beyond a few if they actually existed. The one who unambiguously existed was Simon the Righteous, Shimon Atzadik, who we have record of um, from outside rabbinic literature. Uh, but because we know he existed doesn't mean that he was a member of a group called Zugot, who passed on tradition from one to the other. Let's focus on Hillel and Shammai. Um, outside of rabbinic literature, Hillel and Shammai are never once mentioned. Um, there's certain mentions um, in Josephus or elsewhere which are construed this way, but you have to press them. They're uh, totally unclear. A clear reference to Hillel and Shammai outside of rabbinic literature does not exist. Now, what that means is one of two things. Um, it means that Hillel and Shammai are um, kind of legendary heroic inventions, uh, people standing at the beginning of what the rabbis imagined to begin to be the foundation of what would become rabbinic Judaism. Alternatively, they may have existed, but they had no power or influence whatsoever. And that's actually the more interesting possibility for us. If they didn't exist, there's not a lot to say about it. Um, except that they don't provide us with any evidence regarding the power influence of the rabbis. If they did exist more urgently, they do provide us with evidence um, of the absence of any authority or influence. Because if they had any authority or influence, uh, Josephus would have written about them. And again, never does. Um, coming to the Sanhedrin, uh, the rabbis have an imation, uh, imagination of what the Sanhedrin was, uh, which is recorded in Tractate Sanhedrin. It is, as I just said, an imagination, and it's idealized. The real Sanhedrin, and there was a real Sanhedrin, was a body that was convoked by the nominal king of Judea, Herod, during that time. It's not clear that it met regularly. Uh, many historians think that it didn't meet regularly at all, um, that it was called together to serve as a rubber stamp on uh, royal decrees to give it some kind of generalized authority. Um, but it certainly looked nothing like what we see represented in the Mishnaic tractate by that name. And crucially, there is no way to construe the actual Sanhedrin as having any power or let alone leadership. Um, the power and leadership during that time was the nominal Jewish king, as I said, Herod and relatives, the different Herods. Um, and the reason they had power and influence, frankly, was because they were convenient to the Romans. There are so many really amazing questions here. I don't, I don't know how long you want to keep going. Okay, give a couple uh, more and then I'll go okay. on. We, we, go, we go to um, 2.30, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, we got plenty of time. Okay. Um, so, well, maybe actually just a quick contextual um, set of contextual questions. So um, there was a question about um, what's the population of, of Jews sort of in this uh, community of ritual practice that we're talking about this this post-destruction time, um, if we can even estimate. And someone else asked, how many rabbis are we even talking about? Is it 25 rabbis, 500 rabbis? So where are we in terms of uh, quantity? Excellent question. Excellent question. Um, so um, here, first of all, the general population. Um, population of Jews in the land of Israel. I'm going to begin now using the term Palestine, even though some people take it to be, you know, to be a political reference. It's not. It's simply the way historians refer to the land that Jews called the land of Israel. Um, so how many Jews lived in Palestine after the destruction of the temple? Um, of course, it's notoriously difficult to do demographics um, with pre-modern populations. But we're talking about 
a few million, right? And not a lot, right? Meaning a few million, that's not insubstantial, right? But it's not a vast population by any means. Is it one, is it two? Um, dubious whether it works its way up to three. Um, and some people would actually suggest a number lower than what I'm suggesting now. In terms of rabbis, that's actually easy because you can count their names. Um, and during all of the generations leading up to the Mishnah, so the latter part of the first century and through the second century, we're talking about barely more than 100 rabbis. Were the rabbis whose names weren't mentioned? Yeah, there may have been, but you know, we're talking about a very, very small number in any given generation. Okay, so, so, so you're going us back to the rabbis, unless you have another question there, I'll well, go on with. Just to clarify what you just said, so so do you assume that all the, that the named rabbis in rabbinic literature were actual people? You mean if the record, um, except for the earliest partially legendary, mm -hmm. right? So for example, if you ask me whether there was a Hillel, I would say, I don't know, and it really doesn't matter very much. Mm -hmm. um, if you ask me, was there a Rabbi Judah the Patriarch or even a Rabbi Akiba, I would say yes. Okay, so if they're named, we have reason to to think that they were around. Can I, can I ask you? No, yes. I, I want to ask you one more question, if that's sure. Okay. So a few people, just more substantive than the contextual one, a few people were kind of um, pressing to understand why, um, maybe you're going to get to this, so why was there kind of a need post-destruction to to reinvent everything. We have, you know, there's there's evidence of people doing, you know, kind of some local sacrifice, you know, local preachers and teachers. Um, could could not people have just kind of, uh, you know, sort of localized what had been cent localized what had been centralized, or it, or is it possible that some people weren't even so bothered by the destruction and kept doing their their local thing? Um, so those are two questions. That I, my, my answer to the, the first part of what you said is, yeah, that was option number one, right? Which is you try to keep on doing whatever you can. Um, but there was no one, all right? And no one means in the sentence, almost literally no one, um, who would have thought that the destruction of the temple wasn't something to pay attention to uh, and be deeply, deeply worried about. Um, and so uh, even if you struggled, attempted to preserve the local practices to the extent that you could. And I believe that's in fact what most Jews did in the short term. It doesn't answer sort of the larger question, which is the consequence of the loss of the temple for the observance of central Jewish observances, such as the pilgrimage festivals, um, maintaining Jews' relationship with God and the offering of the sacrifices, and symbolically, this was just, you know, this was the proof that God was with us as far as most Jews were concerned. So to lose that is catastrophic. It's impossible to exaggerate the- It would have, it would have been too much of an ask to try to, uh, to expect people to kind of recreate that in some local form. Well, well they did. I mean, they did. Well, that's what the rabbis then did, but, they, but not in sort of a, an easy, continuous way. It's, Correct. It's, okay. Correct. All right. Great. Thank Correct. you. Okay, so let me go back and let's look at what, the, you know, the evidence we have from the rabbis, um, which we were about to get to. Let's see, there we go, back to and share. Okay, so let's take the specific examples. And, and these are fascinating examples. Um, th th there are some of you who know that I, you know, did extensive research writing, uh, wrote a book on the development of Jewish eating practices, what we call kashrut. Um, and I'm not going to repeat all of the evidence here, uh, but suffice it to say um, that there is very, very clear evidence to suggest um, that what we call kashrut, that is to say the halachot, the eating practices prescribed by the rabbis, are radically different from the eating practices that Jews observed before based upon the Torah. And I can be very specific here. Um, obviously, if we go back to the Torah, the Torah outlines which animals can be consumed and which cannot be consumed. Um, by intimation, at least, it suggests that 
the slaughter of animals needs to take place in a particular way, in a way that resembles the sacrifices. All of that existed before the rabbis came along. But the other part of kashrut, for those of us who observe it, we know how important it is. Um, the other part of kashrut that did not exist before the rabbis came along was the separation of meat and dairy. Okay, and I say that with absolute confidence. This is not an argument from silence. Um, and let me explain why I say that. Um, there's very abundant testimony to Jews eating. Um, in writers before the destruction of the temple. Pagan writers, um, and I should add to that Jewish writers, talk about Jews eating all the time in apocryphal writings, in you know, writings observing Jewish antisocial behavior because they refuse to eat with us, all that kind of thing. So there's abundant testimony to Jewish eating, and there is not a single reference to Jews separating meat and dairy. Given the quantity of descriptions of meals and their practices, um, the absence of that reference is very, very clear evidence that this didn't exist. The rabbis invented it. The question becomes, why did the rabbis invent it? I could comment on that, but you know that would lead to a longer discussion relative to the book that I wrote. If we have time to come back to it at the end and somebody's interested, I can say something about that. Um, Shabbat Nehruv law. Right. This is something else which is very interesting. Uh, obviously, Shabbat goes back to the very beginning um, in the Torah itself. Um, we don't actually know a lot about the way Shabbat was observed uh, during the period of the biblical documents. There's very little reference. First of all, the Torah says almost nothing about what you're not permitted to do on the Sabbath. Um, apocryphal writings, Dead Sea Scrolls and the like, begin to detail laws. Interestingly, the only prohibition that every post-Torah reference agrees on is that you're not allowed to carry on the Sabbath, right? The reason I observe that is because what I'll get to in a moment in a discussion of Eruv. But um, it is the rabbis for the first time who offer a comprehensive system um, for observing the Sabbath and all of its prohibitions. The closest we get to that are very late in the Second Temple period. One of the Dead Sea Scrolls includes a fairly detailed Sabbath law, and the Book of Jubilees does too, but neither of them approaches in any way what the rabbis create. We come to the rabbis, and we've got two very, very long tractates devoted to Sabbath observance and the prohibitions. One is called Tractate Shabbat, one is called Tractate Eruvin. And it's Eruvin which is interesting because what Eruv does, some of you will know this, but let me just make sure everybody is on the same page here. What Eruv does is to invent a notion that there are four domains defined technically for purposes of Sabbath observance and that the only one in which you are forbidden to carry is what's called the public domain. But again, this is a technical definition. And the rabbis, in their cleverness, define public domains out of existence. Both Talmuds, the Babylonian and the Palestinian Talmud, say there is no such thing as a public domain in the world. Any other kind of domain you can carry in if you create an Eruv, most of us think of Eruv as a boundary, even a wire around the territory. That's actually not the Eruv. The Eruv was a dish that was placed out with food that was shared commonly. The word Eruv means to mix. So you mix domains belonging to several individuals into a common domain. Um, and within the territory of that Eruv, which is defined by its boundary um, and symbolized by the food, um, you can carry. This is unprecedented and outrageous. There is nothing that reform did in the 19th or 20th century that was more radical than the rabbis creating of a roof. Okay, so um, we can put that on the table too. It's a piece of evidence. But again, how many people observe this? Even the rabbis admit um, that there are Jews. They don't tell us how many, uh, but there are observant Jews out there who won't 
uh, tolerate the observance of Eruv, who don't accept, in other words, the rabbi's practice. The last thing here is prayers and blessings. I mean not prayer in general, but formal, regularized prayer and the blessings. Uh, I've done this before with groups like this, so I don't want to go into detail, but suffice it to say that formal organized prayer and the and the blessing system were invented by the rabbis um and they actually say as much um so the you know the question becomes why do they and they invent these things after the destruction of the temple what need do they serve i i'm quite sure that many of you know of the notion that the prayers replace the sacrifices that is surely one of the things that prayers do um, not long ago in a session uh, during one of these series, I um, actually commented on the blessings. The blessings invite us to find God everywhere, um, not only in the temple, not only in limited domains, but in the experiences of everyday life, when we wake up, when we see natural phenomena, when we eat, when we go to sleep, and so forth. Um, and so, you know, what need do they serve? If you believe that God is no longer with you following the destruction of the temple, um, they give you um, something uh, to help you hold on, at least. So that is the short-term evidence. Remember, everything I just said about the rabbis um, suggests that they were in significant respects, not entirely by any means, but in significant respects, very discontinuous from what came before. Um, and the outside evidence suggests that most Jews were just doing what people living in an Eastern Roman province would do. When we look to the slightly longer evidence, um, we actually find something fairly similar, uh, although things have clearly begun to change. Um, on the one hand, you've got, say, the Galilean synagogues, which many of you know, either from visiting those sites in Israel or from uh, images and you know, programs presenting them, um, and um, with one exception, which I'll comment on in a moment, um, they all, right, in their floors, in their mosaics, include what we would call pagan images. That is to say, not only zodiacs with images of living creatures and humans, which would have been prohibited by the Ten Commandments, but even in their centers, images of gods. Um, the Roman god Helios is in the center uh, of many of those. Jews probably simply would have identified that god with the superior god, which was their god too. Um, but this was far from anything that a rabbi would have approved of. Um, hence the separation between synagogue and rabbi I mentioned before. The earliest evidence we have of rabbinic influence in a synagogue is the Rehov synagogue. There's some debate about the dating of it, 6th, 7th century. Um, but even if it's 6th century, it's one synagogue amongst many. It has in the center of the mosaic a quotation of agricultural laws from rabbinic literature. Um, and it is evidence that what the rabbis have been doing has begun to succeed. Um, but the process is a long one, and there are still many steps to take before we go on. On the other hand, of course, we've got the abundant literature from the rabbis themselves, Midrash, Talmuds, and so forth. Uh, as I've already said, they were exclusively rabbinic. They spoke, um, it was the rabbis speaking to rabbis for the most part, although we'll nuance that in a few moments. And the rabbinic documents, um, I think without exception are elitist. Um, some people would argue that the Midrash uh, is not elitist, I agree that it's not elitist in the same sense. Um, it has a more general attraction. But if you look at what the actual Midrash says, as opposed to the stories that appear in Midrash, Midrash is no less difficult uh, than is Talmud. You need great command of scripture to make sense of Midrash. And so I would say that Midrash inclines in the direction of a more popular communication, uh, but it's still not there by any means. Um, so, um, the question now becomes, how do the rabbis begin to exert influence, right? Since it took them centuries to do that. Um, and the answer has to be in some of the things that I suggest here, and I invite you to suggest other things to be sure to ask about these. 
Um, but there's no doubt in my mind, at least, that these are central um, to the process that, process that we're considering. First of all, education, not only the fact that they were highly educated, Torah expertise uh, is crucial in the rabbi's influence, but in that they sought to educate others. They literally invented rituals. One of the best known of those rituals, which all of you know, is the Seder, right? So the Passover Seder is a rabbinic ritual. It did not exist before in anything approaching the form that we have now. And if you open up and look carefully at your Haggadot, what you will see is that central to the Seder is rabbinic texts, right? I sometimes play the game of asking people to recite for me any Mishnah that they know by heart out loud, right? So think to yourself for a moment. Do you know any Mishnah by heart? If I've done this with you before, you already know the answer. Um, but the rabbis were so clever, they didn't tell us it was Mishnah, but they had us memorizing the so-called four questions from the Haggadah are actually a quotation from the Mishnah, right? So anybody who's ever learned the four questions already knows Mishnah by heart. There's Midrash in the Haggadah. This is a form of rabbinic education. Literacy. Literacy was very, very rare in the ancient world. First of all, literal literacy, being able to read, let alone being able to write. Extremely rare because documents were all copied by hand. They were all manuscripts. It was very difficult to get texts to practice on. Therefore, education often took place orally. Um, the rabbis were amongst the rare individuals who had a level of literacy that allowed them to be experts, say, in relationship to the marketplace, in relationship to the court. They could have offered themselves as civil servants to the leaders because they possessed a skill that very few possessed, which was, as I just said, they were literate. Um, they could read and they might even be able to write. Um, and so that put them in a position uh, of potential power. Torah expertise, to be sure, um, because Jews did respect those who knew the Torah well. And if you wanted to kind of impress people as an ancient and not so ancient Jew, represent yourself as an expert in the Torah, and you will gain respect. You will gain authority in the community. And the rabbis took advantage of all of these things. Um, some of them are ideological, but they are also all of them at the same time pragmatic. In the land of Israel and Palestine, they also um, sought out, and rabbinic literature testifies to this, relationships with the Nasi, with the patriarch, um, who, when we get into the latter part of the third, fourth century in particular, um, gained considerable power, uh, but lost that power about a quarter of the way into the 400s, in the fifth century, but to the extent of time that the Nasi was powerful and influential, the rabbis made connections. So in a very pragmatic way, they sought to take advantage of that connection to offer their expertise to gain influence and power um, where it was to be gained. Now I'm going to play a little trick on you here. Let's see. Okay, so that's how did the rabbis gain influence in Palestine? That's the rabbis. How did they gain influence in Babylonia? Notice what happens when I go back and forth between the two screens. The screens are identical except for the last line. And the only reason I have to make a difference in the last line is because the head of the Jewish community in the land of Israel was called the patriarch, the Nasi, and in Babylonia was called the Resh Galuta, um, the Aramaic form of the Hebrew, Rosh Hagalut, um, or in Greek, the Exilarch. Everything I just said about rabbis in Palestine would have been the case amongst rabbis for the very ancient Jewish community in Babylonia, who would have had no reason to listen to a rabbi when the rabbis first came from Palestine. They lived their lives at a distance from the temple, even before the temple was destroyed, very, very comfortably. And so how would the rabbis have gained affluence there? Uh, influence, I should say, not affluence. How would they have gained influence there? The answer has to be something along the same lines, right? So adding to everything I just said, in order for 
the rabbis to succeed, there's something that needed to be true. And this is true of a successful ongoing leadership in any generation. Um, why would common Jews have accepted the rabbis as their leaders? The answer is because they gave their Jewish lives in the absence of the temple meaning, purpose, and foundation. Now, those are very general terms, and there are many ways to do that. Um, and you've got to have a very clear sense um, of where you're going. You have to have a very, very, very clear sense, if you're going to offer this possibility, of what might work and what might not work. But one way or the other, if what the rabbis created, which combined both that which was inherited, the old, with the new, which you've already heard me describe as in some measure radically new, um, if it didn't give Jews meaning, purpose, and foundation, then there's simply not a chance that it would have worked. And so how did they do that? I have already touched on some of that, but let me spell it out a little bit. Um, prayer, as I said a few moments ago, one of the things that prayer did uh, was to, you know, quote unquote, replace the sacrifices that earlier had been offered in the temple. And the rabbis do use the term avodah, which means service and was applied to the sacrifices for prayer as well. Um, it's not just prayer that the rabbis formulated, but it's connected to the fact that the prayer, and here I mean prayer in the technical sense, which for the rabbis was the amidah, and I'll focus on the amidah, the silent standing prayer that was recited most often during the week, the daily one. It's a prayer for redemption, um, but it's a prayer for redemption that draws upon historical models, the exodus from Egypt, in order to say, God, you've got the power, do it for us again. So when you pray for redemption and you do it again and again and you gain patience with the recognition that what you pray for today, you're going to have to pray for again tomorrow, this actually both gave Jews hope, but also um, taught them patience uh, because they know that they're going to have to pray for it again tomorrow. The blessings, as I said before, are a way the rabbis created for Jews recognizing God's presence throughout their lives, in the marketplace, in the bedroom, in the bathroom. I, I mean, and here, look at the last thing. You can see that I emphasize this boldly and in italics. There was not an area of life that was outside of the rabbinic system. It included home practices, right? So blessings were often recited at home. Obviously, eating was often done at home. Um, Sabbath practices are often at home. You know, Judaism doesn't take place in a separate realm. There's no special sacred realm like the temple. Um, and as far as the rabbis were concerned, synagogue had very limited privilege. Um, there was nothing better about the synagogue as such because Jewish life took place everywhere in the marketplace. Right? It's a way to trade. It's a way to make up for the exchanges that have not happened according to the law. I'm fond of pointing out, uh, you know, I, as you all know, I teach at the Jewish Theological Seminary. Um, we train rabbis, many of whom, certainly not all of whom, but it is conventionally assumed that to be trained as a rabbi is first and foremost to be trained as someone uh, who will be an expert in synagogue practices, prayer, life cycle, and the like. And we certainly emphasize that in our education quite appropriately. But uh, I run a thought experiment with my students. I say, imagine a set of Talmud, right? The Talmud is the compendium of discussions of Jewish practice. So imagine a set of Talmud on your bookshelves and tell me how many of the tractates from the normally 20 volumes that are printed, it could be depending upon their, how they're combined, a few less than that, um, but from all of those many tractates, um, how many of them deal with the synagogue? How many of them deal with prayer? Now, my students do know that to look at tractate brachot, for prayer and blessings. And they're certainly correct in doing that, although there's far more 
than synagogue prayers and blessings in tractate brachot, if I then ask them, so where do you find laws about the synagogue if the synagogue is so important? And they don't know the answer to that before I teach it to them, because there is not a tractate in the Mishnah or the Talmud that obviously deals with the synagogue. So the system the rabbis created didn't suffice, didn't settle for a Jewish life in a limited realm. It said that Jewish life has meaning and purpose in every realm of life. Um, and as our teenagers at Camp Ramah know, it even includes um, sexual relation and so forth. Um, it's got something to say, uh, often very wise, about every realm of Jewish life. Um, and so what's the outcome all of, of all of this? You know what? I'm actually, before we go to this, I see that's a good transition. Um, so this is the setup for the success, all that I just uh, suggested, uh, Julia. So let's take a few minutes out, and then I'll lead to the final uh, piece. So go ahead. Okay. There's like a whole um, book to be written from these questions. Um, I wrote it. They can go back and read it. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 um, I put the link to your book earlier in the chat. Okay. Um, okay. Um, there were there were a few questions about um, about other religions. Naturally, people asked about um, what's going on with Christianity at this time, and how does what you're talking about fit in with that, or um, you know, I mean, even back when you were when we were sort of defining rabbi, what's the relationship <clears throat> there uh, to what Christians might define as rabbis? But more specifically, um, um, sorry, <laughs> there's so much here. Um, all right, so that's so sort of that's okay. there was there was. Let me let me uh, throw in a few more here. Um, one person. Um, wrote the exposure of the Babylonian Jewish centers to Zoroastrianism was pivotal to future survival and development of Judaism. And then, um, and then someone asked also um, that asking how Jewish interfacing with Greco-Roman um, learning um, and, and leadership might have impacted, you know, how rabbis were conceived of. I know that was a lot. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot there, and each one of them requires a separate, uh, not session, but course. Um, but, um, you know, let me do it as quickly as I can. Um, the, I mean, as most of you know, the Roman world was becoming Christian during this period. Um, in the um, fourth century, early in the fourth century, the empire became officially Christian. There was a brief reaction, but the reaction didn't last very long in the mid fourth century. By the year 400, the majority of residents of the empire uh, were Christian, and that included Palestine. Most of the people that Jews, including rabbis, would have seen uh, on the roads in the cities of Palestine from the year 400 onward would have been Christian. Um, it was an interesting challenge. Part of what made it interesting is um, it represented an alternative response to the destruction of the temple. Um, the, the reason Christians into the Middle Ages hated the Talmud so much, the Talmud representing rabbinic Judaism, is because Rabbinic Judaism and Christianity both began in reality. I mean, there was obviously a Jesus before the destruction of the temple, um, but and Paul, you know, lived and taught. But Christianity really got going after the destruction as well. And both Rabbinic Judaism and Christianity sought to offer a response to that destruction. Rabbinic Judaism responding in the ways I've just described, and Christianity saying, "Guess what, folks? The old, the, you know, the old um, covenant." is broken, um, and the new true covenant uh, has now been born. You don't need a temple anymore because Jesus is the perfect sacrifice, offering himself as the perfect high priest in the perfect temple, uh, and Jesus's sacrifice atones for all of your sins. Um, notice how all of that, aside from the name Jesus, is thoroughly Jewish, to be more specific, is thoroughly Levitical in its way of thinking about the relationship between um, the Israel and God. And of course, uh, Christians claim to be the true Israel. The word Israel doesn't mean something weird and different. 
It certainly doesn't mean a modern stage. The word Israel is the way Jews refer to themselves. So true Israel is a claim to be the true Jews of the covenant. That's Christian. Zoroastrianism, the history of Jews with Zoroastrianism goes back many, many centuries to the origins of the Torah itself. Yes, um, the rabbis, along with other Jews, would have been comfortable with many of the Zoroastrian ideas um, that were central to Persian religious life. Um, that's why Jews felt so much at home in what they called Babylon. Um, but this is not new with the rabbis, and uh, it, it was actually part of the DNA uh, of Judaism from the time that Jews came back from the Babylonian exile back in the sixth century, the late part, the latter part of the sixth century BCE. That was number two. What was number three? I forget. Uh, Greco-Roman learning and leadership. Yeah, I mean, I, here, th that I'll send, I mean, there are many other places to go. Bert Vysotsky wrote a good accessible book about that. Um, the, the rabbis were significantly Greco-Roman Hellenized. Um, they're easily identifiable as rabbis as such, but um, they learned from their neighbors. They were open to those lessons. Uh, and so um, we shouldn't think as is conventional amongst those who think in a kind of stereotyped way about the Maccabees and the Hellenistic kingdoms of Jews versus Hellenism. Um, Jews learned from Hellenism uh, and rabbinic Judaism, along with Christianity, I might add, were significantly Hellenized. Okay, so um, that let me, now I know there's more questions, but let me just do the last piece because then you can open up to whatever questions we have time for. Let me share the last couple of things on my screen. Um, share, and let me go to the next one. So all of what I just described led to a reality that by the dawn of the Muslim era, this was about, you know, the about a third of the way, half of the way, depending upon what precisely you're looking at, um, into the seventh century of common era. Historians believe that by this time, about half of Jews were rabbinized, which means that they recognized rabbinic authority and rabbinic practice. Um, other Jews remained with what they understood to be the traditional practices that were commanded them by ancient Hebrew scripture, by the Torah, uh, later on, they would come to be called Karaites, but there were many Jews who were not rabbis who were just Jews during this period, uh, and they would continue for centuries. The project of Judaism becoming rabbinic Judaism did not end at this time. They had achieved, the rabbis did considerable success, um, but there was more to be done. Uh, by the Middle Ages, there were still Karaites around, and it depends where in the Jewish world we're looking. So let's actually take the late Middle Ages or early modernity, 15th century. By that time, the vast majority of Jews were rabbinized. There were still Karaites around. Um, but again, it was slow. It was sure. It was committed. How in the world did the rabbis achieve this? It's absolutely miraculous um, that Judaism became rabbinic Judaism. Um, over the course of such a long period of time. So first of all, obviously, they were patient and they were slow, right? If they had to um, give their funders, they didn't have funders, but if they had to um, give their funders semi-annual reports, the funders would have pulled out a long time ago um, because the rabbis were willing to let this take a long time. Um, they had, and you can see this a little bit below on the slide, they had a very clear vision and they were committed to it and confident of it. In other words, the world went its ways. Obviously, the third century is different from the fifth, which is different from the 12th, but they were convinced that they had it right and they were patient to teach it again and again and again. Um, they worked at their own level. They could not have been nearly as creative as they were um, if they didn't work in working groups, as it were, right? If they didn't sit and create the Talmud, which was very, very elite. But at the same time, they asked themselves, these things that we're doing, where and how can they be communicated at the general level? So 
The elite side of the rabbinic project was, was in the Talmud. The more popular was in certain parts of Midrash um, to the degree that there were public lectures that emerged from the study, well, synagogues to be sure, um, when the rabbis could gain a foothold and give sermons in those places, wherever they could find a place to communicate, to influence, they were open to that. Again, it could be the marketplace uh, and it could be the home. All of those were the arenas where rabbinic Judaism operated. Crucially, and this in part was made possible by the elitist arena where all of this originated, they were flexible, right? In other words, they didn't simply say, we've got to go back to the old and hold it to the degree possible. Um, quite the contrary, they were extremely flexible, they were adaptive, they were often bold. Um, I, I mean, I think that prayer, blessings, um, a roof, um, those are all excellent examples. I mean, just these extraordinary um, new ideas. And there are many, many others. Some of them are in the specifics of practice, and some of them are just in the claim that in the relationship between God and the Jewish people, it's often the Jewish people that has to take the first step. Right? If you go back to the Torah, it's God who takes the first step. The most common verse in the entire Torah is, and God spoke to Moses saying, Right? It appears again and again and again. And God spoke to Moses saying, right? The rabbis respond and said, we know what God said. We've got in the Torah. Now we're the ones who are going to do the same. We're going to interpret it and we're going to interpret it boldly. And we're even going to make new things that don't come from interpretation. We'll legislate them as new practices. That's the difference between what the rabbis called the Araita and the Rabbanan. They had a very clear vision and they were committed to and confident of their vision. And I want to end, and I'm doing this now rather than waiting, because I want you to be able to touch on this too um, before we end, if you like. Um, for all of us, the question is, you know, how do we relate to them? How is our age similar to or different from the rabbinic age? How are our leaders similar to or different from the rabbis as leaders? Um, do we have a bold vision of Jewish life? Do we have a clear vision of Jewish life? Are we confident in it? Are we willing to stand for it? And all of this relates to what in many ways might have been the first point here. Um, and that is, what kind of age are we living in? Um, are we living in an age of long continuities, recognizing that all human ages um, have disruptions? Um, or are we living in an age of radical disruption as the period following the destruction of the temple was for Jews, an age of radical disruption? Um, many people, of course, think the Holocaust is such a radical disruption, um, and we could certainly consider that. Um, many people would consider the birth of the state of Israel as a radical disruption, one radically negative and one radically positive, um, but still radical disruptions. Um, and what kind of response is necessitated when your world changes in ways that were previously unimagined, right? How do you build new in a world which is um, so radically different. Here, I'm going to just offer very, very quickly and briefly um, a small example of my own response to that. Uh, I believe that changes in attitudes toward gender and roles um, is radical um, and it changes the world in significant ways. It was for that reason that when I was a young faculty member at JTS um, and I was on the faculty assembly, Body and it came up the vote for whether we admit rabbi uh, women as rabbis or for, as rabbinical candidates to the rabbinical school. Um, I was convinced by those who said that it wasn't a halachic move. I didn't think the halachic argument for rabbi for women as rabbis was well done, right? But I said to myself, we are living in a radically new age when it comes to these matters, and so I voted in favor because I believed that in this respect, we live in an age 
that is closely parallel to the early rabbinic age. And just as they were willing to be bold, I thought that we had the obligation to do the same. I don't, I mean, I believe I made the right choice. You're welcome to evaluate it as you like. And I offer it only as an example um, of how someone might think about what I've presented. The rest of the time is devoted to any questions that you choose, Julia. All right, so I wanna, um, let's come back in a few minutes to what you were just talking about so that we can sort of end with the present. Um, but going way back, uh, there were a few people asked about the destruction of the first temple and what was, um, what was the difference sort of why did the destruction of the second temple lead to this total recreation in a way that the first temple didn't or was it that the roots of this actually, uh, you know, were, were um, being planted or taking, taking root or whatever after the first destruction? Well, well, first of all, why assume that the first temple didn't? I mean, if we assume that the first temple didn't, then the answer would be because the second temple was built in a very short period of time, right? So the crisis represented by the destruction of a temple was quickly ameliorated, right? But the truth is that the first temple did lead to radical response and revision. According to biblical scholars, the Torah itself and large parts of the rest of Hebrew scripture and what they represent and the directions they suggest are actually a response to the destruction of the first temple and the Babylonian exile. Um, so there, there are direct parallels there. Mm -hmm. so, so maybe the difference is that it doesn't describe itself as such, <clears throat> right? It's, what we have doesn't say, here, you know, here I am, a response to the destruction, but that, but you're saying that's, that's. Yeah. And, and, and the rabbis <laughs> often don't do that either. Listen, I mean, the rabbis communicated differently in their more popular literature and amongst themselves. Amongst themselves, they were willing to admit a lot of scandalous things. You know, when it went out in public, they changed their tune, but that's what leaders do. Mm -hmm. So on that note, um, someone, um, was asking about, and you were talking about kind of their confidence in their project. Um, and could you give us, you know, a little taste of that? Like where, you know, what's a passage or two where they, they kind of reflect on their, on their project with confidence? <laughs> I see that. Um, well, I, I mean, I'm going to give you two related answers to that. The first is in many of their radical interpretations of scripture, right? Um, where they interpret scripture in ways that scripture could not possibly have imagined. They were about as distant from originalists as any group of people ever could have been. Um, they cannot have been insensitive to the radical quality of many of their interpretations. And one of the ways they do this, and this is very clearly stated, um, is... Um, in the Talmud, when they ask for the source of a law, or more often for the source of a dispute in the law, and they'll say, if you want, I'll say that it's reasoning, and if you want, I'll say it's scripture. In other words, they suggest it doesn't matter whether you begin with reasoning, which is human, or scripture, which they believe to be divine, you can play with both of them. Now, that's pretty radical. There's... Um... You know, there's a Mishnah where they talk about the um, s several areas of Jewish law hanging on a thread. Um, you know, some having more biblical basis than others. Would you would would you cite that as well? Absolutely, and in my writing, I do cite it. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. When you say, I mean, this is what's interesting. You've got like laws of sacrifices and equipment. Yeah, they've got a lot of scripture. Okay. But then you go and you say, laws of Sabbath are like mountains hanging by a thread, right? They're already, they're already admitting that their vast rabbinic system is tied by a thread to its scriptural foundation. Now, that's going pretty far, but they then define a third category, which goes even further, which is laws that are flying in the air. And flying in the air means they have no connection to scripture whatsoever. That is the way the rabbis characterize their own corpus. That's one of my favorite missions. Thank, uh, you, for, thank you for reminding us all of it. Um, all right. So so in our last few minutes, um, so let's come back to the present. Um, so there was, I mean, early on, there was some um, 
you know, people were proposing alternatives to your uh, your analogy to, you know, if we imagined, God forbid, the destruction of the state of Israel. Um, and, and I think we're reflecting more on um, or making connections more to other, you know, other widespread phenomena that we see, as you were just discussing at the end, in terms of um, loss of connection to institutional Judaism, um, lack of connection, lack of uh, affiliation from synagogues, you know, JCCs, federations, other kinds of um, sort of anchoring Jewish organizations. One person, I'm trying to find it. Um, one person said, "Are we are we witnessing?" Um, are we, are we now unwinding this process of rabbinization? Um, someone said that, you know, we sort of this, this got us through to today or, you know, to the, through the 20th century, let's say, and, and people now, now there's sort of a whole bunch of people who want something radically different and other people who are terrified of change. So you're, yeah, so, okay. So are we living through such an age? And I, I yeah, I mean, the answer is we are, but we don't need to be living through that age. What I mean by that is we have regrettably, most of us, yielded rabbinic Judaism to not only the Orthodox, but the ultra-Orthodox, right? We have, for reasons that I understand but resent, um, granted that they somehow have ownership of this. Um, I know the historical reasons. I can actually, you know, draw the path along why that all happened. But I think it's terrible if we took as our model, not, you know, recent rabbis of whatever stripe, but um, ancient rabbis. Um, and the kind of model that I just suggested, this is why I've, well, you know, my whole life since I discovered it, been drawn to the model of the classical rabbis. Because I think that we can, you know, live in this age of disaffiliation. I mean, one of the reasons I think that Jews are disaffiliating, aside from the fact that this is a very broad phenomenon in the world and now in the United States, the United States has been churched um, to a far greater extent than Europe um, until recently. I mean, we're a couple of decades behind, but now we're experiencing the same thing. Um, and Jews are participating in that. In fact, in some respects, our leaders of that and have been. Um, but I actually believe that if there were a model that were closer to what the rabbis did in response to what we see in the world, I think we'd be in a lot better shape. Um, the problem is that we're too timid. Uh, I think, we, you know, we, we just don't have the boldness and confidence that they did. But how many people have through history? Mm -hmm. You know, your, your colleague, Rabbi Joel Roth, he would always um, say to students, you know, the rabbis were conservative Jews, which I think is kind of, kind of what you're, you're getting. I mean, maybe. Yeah, I, 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 well, I might have a different way of characterizing it. I, I think they would have been non-denominational, but that's another, right. it's another discussion. I mean, I wonder if, if um, you know, if we actually have been bold, but it's sort of not, some of that boldness is not universally accepted or some of it is seen as kind of watering down tradition. Um, it's not recognized exactly. as bold. Enough. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, um, so just in the last few minutes, people were, were you know, mentioning, uh, you know, I was talking about uh, disaffiliation, but people were talking about other kind of seismic changes, um, technology, COVID, which are actually related, right? Because COVID has sort of pushed the world online. Um, and there's a, you know, the whole phenomenon of, of things going viral in a global way um, is is like really world changing. Um, so I I don't know if you want to reflect in the last few minutes on on any. Yeah, I would say, I would say, I don't think COVID is world changing. That's my personal opinion. It certainly changed our worlds in a limited way, but that's only because of the limits of human memory and sensibility. Um, you know, there was. A, a, I mean, there have been pandemics of all sorts throughout the centuries. It's part of human experience. We are no different than any other humans in that respect. The plague, right, the bubonic plague, which was far, far worse than COVID, um, remains in Europe re-emerging for several hundred years. 
Um, and each time it reemerged um, locally, it did very considerable damage in its local eruption. So I don't think it changes the world. I think it just reminds us that we're the same as humans have always been in our vulnerability. Um, I think that technology is very important because it allows us to respond differently um, than people did in the past. It actually, you know, give, give despite all of our losses, and they were tragic. Um, nevertheless, it allowed fewer of us um, to fall victim um, than would have fallen, you know, equivalently in the past. Um, but listen, I, I mean, you, you and I have spoken about this. You know, I feel this. Um, the invention of the printing press was no less radical uh, a shift in uh, in technology than our recent shift, and that didn't lead to the end of rabbinic Judaism or church affiliation or anything else. There are a lot of factors here, um, you know, and creative, clever, confident people respond to those factors, absorb them, uh, and move on in meaningful ways. And I think that, I mean, by the way, I think there's a lot of evidence of that with COVID and online existence. I think this and similar programs, right, with hundreds of people who come back again and again and again, we didn't have the opportunity for this kind of education in the past, not because we didn't have the technology for it five years ago, but because we weren't forced to take advantage of the technology. You and your department, right, and other equivalent bodies actually did something radically wonderful. Um, in creating these programs. Um, does that mean we're broken? No, on the contrary, right? It means we've got a lot to do. Um, and so, you know, the way you would follow that up, if this is my last comment, would be saying, yes, we've got a lot to do and I'll see you in two weeks or something like that. Awesome. Thank you for the for the nice words. I, I, yeah, I think, I think um, I'm just imagining a whole other conversation where we talk about the influencers of today, which can be anyone who people decide to watch, and the and the influencers you've been talking about, so much more to talk about. But this was, and this was fantastic. Um, thank you so much for for all of this. And I do want people to come back in two weeks. Um, again, we're off next week, um, for July third, but the following week, July tenth, um, Rabbi Eliezer Diamond will be teaching us, um on the power of words, how what we say affects us and those around us. So he'll be talking about um, how, you know, good and good and ill effects of speech and, um, and how changing our speech can impact our character and other kinds of change related to speech. So um, thank you so much, Professor Kramer, for this wonderful session. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to share all these amazing questions and comments with you because they're really something. And, uh, and we look forward to learning with you again. Thanks once again to our sponsors, the Shalevs, for your generosity. And we'll look forward to seeing all of you again in a couple of weeks. Okay, bye-bye, thank you.